Illinois faces some big challenges. Today, we're about to hear a truly honest analysis of the problems we face. Equally as important, you'll also hear an in-depth discussion of some practical solutions. This is your radio source for stories, the insight, and the answers you won't hear anywhere else. Not in the media and not coming from Springfield. You're listening to Illinois Rising, presented by the Illinois Policy Institute. Now, here's your host, AM 560's Dan Proft. Dan Proft, welcome to another edition of Illinois Rising. You can catch me Monday to Friday, 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. with Amy Jacobson on Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560. And uh, joining me for this edition is Ted Dabrowski. He's the Vice President of Policy for the Illinois Policy Institute. Ted, great to have you again. Thank you. Uh, So the school year has started in Chicago, and uh, with the advent of the school year comes uh, another rite of fall, which is the Chicago Teachers Union threatening a strike. And uh, apparently uh, we have a date set of September 21st where the Chicago Teachers Union, under the stewardship of um, Karen Lewis, I'll just just say Karen Lewis, uh, is not going to accept the budget that was advanced by the administration, which would include a phase out of the Chicago public school system picking up the teacher's contribution to their pensions. This is the stumbling block. This is the issue over which Karen Lewis has threatened that she is prepared to strike and seems to be serious about that. It was deja vu. You know, we were talking about this in 2012. Chicago public school system was already a mess. It was already facing billion dollar deficits. Results, you know, were, were as poor as they've been. And uh, here, here the teachers' union was about to strike and, and put such stress on uh, the system that uh, here we are four years later, it's nearly bankrupt, and here they go again. For a broader perspective on the issue, we're happy to be joined by Dan DeSalvo. He's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He's also a poli-sci professor at the City College of New York and author of the book Government Against Itself, Public Union Power and Its Consequences. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. My pleasure to be with you. So, uh, so here's the thing. Karen Lewis and the Chicago Teachers Union um, is threatening another strike because they know if they strike, they're going to have the support of the parents and they're going to have the support of the, all of those who just uh, dislike uh, Rahm Emanuel. And uh, they're going to have their way with the city administration the same way they did four years ago. So why not continue to demand the unreasonable because they're used to getting it? Well, that's certainly the, they've certainly walked themselves right up to the brink of a strike. And now that they've put this authorization vote uh, on the table as a pressure tactic, as negotiations continue, um, it doesn't, unless something uh, changes, it looks like Chicago is on course for another strike sometime in October. Dan, I, yeah, I'd like to understand from you and you know, you've you've studied this a lot. What makes CT what makes the CTU brand of, of unionism so what well, we, we call it here militant? What why what makes them so special that that they can you know this will be the third strike when you count the short strike earlier. Uh, what makes it so special? Why are they different from other unions? Well, in some sense, the first thing to think about in this case is this is a public employee union. So in that sense, it's very different from the private sector where, you know, there's some market constraints on demands. Here, there's no market. There's a virtual monopoly of a public service, and teachers enjoy many more job protections than um private sector employees do. So there's not much to constrain the demands. And as the teachers unions themselves put it, um, we can always just get more revenue. Um, so in that sense, they're, they're like other unions in the sense that they always want more. It's really the teachers union's job is to represent their members and win them the best deal on pay, benefits, and working conditions. So it's not to, you know, they're not out there to pursue the interests of parents or to pursue the interests first and foremost of students. They're out there to pursue first and foremost the material interests of the teachers. And that, when the chips are down as they are now in Chicago, that's really about more money and job protection. But it's re- it's really difficult to to break through, it seems, and the, thus the success of the teachers' unions and their political influence because 
you have so many families that have a personal relationship with their teachers in a way they don't necessarily have that kind of personal relationship with, you know, frontline employees of other public sector uh, union workers and other units of government. Their, their kid goes to this school, and I know the teacher, and we have a relationship, and I like that teacher, and I want that teacher to be employed, and I want my kid to be in school. And so, you know, kind of look past some of the uh, inexorably problematic math of salaries and benefits because you've got this personal relationship and your teacher is there saying, hey, you know, I don't want to do this. I want to be in the classroom educating your, your children, but uh, the politicians are treating us unfairly. You know, who's going to win that argument? That's right. Teachers are much more sympathetic than many other public groups of public employees, certainly police officers, for example, would be mm. the other end of the spectrum where they have a naturally adversarial relationship um, w- with you know the communities that they have to patrol in some way. So teachers have this more sympathetic thing. The fact that they're public employees and they're teachers leads to the rhetoric that you often hear from Karen Lewis and other teacher union leaders, which is what's good for teachers is good for kids, that they're interests coincide if teachers are well paid and happy um, that will rebound to the benefit of of kids even if there isn't much evidence to support this chiming of interest between the two groups it is a persuasive rhetoric that leads people to sort of look as you say look past many of the tough financial decisions that are confronting uh, you know an entity on the verge of bankruptcy which is the Chicago public schools so, so, Dan, what should happen? You know, you've got a situation where the, the parents strongly supported the, the, uh, the teachers last time around in 2012. Now, since then, things have gotten worse. We've had school shutterings. We've had these, you know, gang uh, protection areas. Uh, we've had it just it's, it's a mess. It's a mess any way you look at it. At what point or how will the parents finally figure out that what the unions are doing is, is against the parents' interest? Or, or does something else have to happen to finally get there? Well, just take start with the strike proposal. The, a strike is once you call it and once teachers walk out, um, you know, now it's a good pressure tactic. Now they have the support of parents. But if you're on strike for two weeks, three weeks, how long can the teachers go before losing the support of parents as they scramble to come up with child care alternatives and balance work and family every day? So for the teachers, there's probably a, there's something of a time limit on how much they can enjoy um, you know, the, the full-throated support of, of parents. And, and that's why a strike is always a really uncertain gamble um, for any union, but especially um, the teachers' union, because all the things that benefit them, those connections to parents and to communities, that then puts them in that directly adversarial relationship um, with parents and with communities. How do you change this paradigm uh, like we have in Chicago, the Chicago public school system and this uh, and that the, the uh, public sector union, the teachers union, essentially running the school system and uh, running over the politicians. I mean, do you essentially have to have at some point uh, a civilian political leadership that is willing to uh, take a page out of Ronald Reagan's book and replace striking teachers or move in that direction of replacing striking teachers to send a message that, uh, you know, this is real and there are a lot of other talented people that want to be in, in uh, education and we're going to find them, and we're going to replace you because, as my high school basketball coach used to tell me, the graveyards are full of indispensable people. Well, I think, you know, certainly the governor, uh, your governor in Illinois, Governor Rauner, has put some measures um, that would allow for greater flexibility and sort of recalibrate the balance between uh, unions, public, especially public employee unions on one side, and um, the state or the local political authorities on the other that is moving in a, a direction of more right-to-work laws. You could change collective bargaining laws. Right now, the political alignments at the state level, um, which would really be required to you know, change both you know, the nature of the, the collective bargaining game that's really privileged the uh, Chicago's teacher union right now at the state level, obviously, is a major impasse. Right. And uh, is another possibility to look, you know, just looking around at uh, other states. Um, one of the ways to do that is just to introduce competition and open the floodgates. Uh, so Florida, for example, with their tax credit program that has now half a billion dollars worth of monies for scholarships to kids for kids to get out of failing schools and to have the same choice that 
wealthier, more politically connected families have. Uh, maybe that that's one of the ways to dilute some of the concentration of power, isn't it? That's right. Uh, you know, you can see one of the negotiating points is to try to that the teachers unions in Chicago, in Illinois, and elsewhere, in my home state of New York, is to constrict the number and growth of charter schools, which would be another source of, of competition to reduce their monopoly, and that's been a subject of um, of the bargain which between CPS and CTU uh, over putting a cap on the growth of charters. They don't want those to grow, so that again requires you know political will and a, and a kind of counter force that's going to do that. He is Dan DeSalvo. He's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, poli sci professor at the City College of New York and the author of the book, Government Against Itself, Public Union Power and Its Consequences. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate your time. My pleasure.